This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And here we are, August the 9th, 2022. And folks, I remember... Uh, I don't remember much about the 70s because, you know, I just turned 50. I was born in 1972. So I get a few memories of the 70s, you know. But I do remember that folks used to take my brothers and I to the drive-in. And, you know, I remember at five years old, my first drive-in movie was Pete's Dragon. And I just so happened to be having one of the uh, actors and stunt players on the show with me today. Folks, I give you the awesome Gary Morgan. How do you do, Gary? Nice to see you, Greg. Everything's great. <laughs> Everything's great except for technology. It's, uh, that's always a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we have... A, a, challenge, a challenge to us older people. <laughs> well, you know what? When I was in high school, we still had typewriters. Now I don't know to be of uh, today's generation even know what one of those is. <laughs> we have phones that were stuck in the wall. We had the thing called phone booths. Superman used to use them. <laughs> so, oh yeah, it's catching up to us, I can tell. <laughs> But, um, you know, before we talk about uh, your film work and whatnot, you know, uh, I know you grew up and, and uh, well, uh, I was going to say in an entertainment family, but it's a little different for, than that because you grew up in the acrobatics. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Well, my parents were acrobats. My mom and dad did an acrobatic act. And uh, when I was five months old, they took me on the road with them. And uh, I was, I grew up backstage, uh, circuses, state fairs, uh, nightclubs, uh, burlesque theaters. They were the straight act. They were, they had an acrobatic dance team. Uh, my mom, when she was younger, opened for Frank Sinatra in 1942 uh, as an acrobat with a, a group. Uh, my parents met when she was uh, opening for Sinatra in Boston, right before World War II, uh, they got married. My father shipped off to Germany, uh, came back and started doing the act. Uh, when I started to talk, acrobats, you know, could do, do a four or five minute act. You can't do acrobatics for too long, mm -hmm. like a circus act. In order to work nightclubs, you had to do a 20 minute act. So when I started to talk, my father taught me how to do little jokes and stand up and uh, then I would do uh, hand balancing with him and they could stretch the act and we could work uh, like nightclubs. We were working some Borscht Belt um, show and uh, a guy came up to my father and said, you should get the kid an agent and he could do commercials. So my father's, I was seven years old. He said, you want to be on television? I said, sure. So got an agent and started working as a kid actor. I was um, in an off-Broadway show in 1958 called Comic Strip with um, Peter Falk and uh, Mike Constantine. Peter Falk, I think it was his first job. And uh, then when I was 10, I did a Broadway show uh, with Lillian Gish, the famous silent Oh, movie wow, star. Birth of a Nation, yep. Yep, yep, and uh, Colleen Dewar, a, a, a play. Uh, you know, a very heavy play. But my dressing roommate, another kid, was Jeff Conaway. He was nine, I was 10. Later on, he played my brother in Pete's Dragon. But we were kid actors together. Um, and then when I was 12, I did a show with Henry Fonda and Olivia de Havilland. I played their son uh, in a show directed by Garson Kanan. So I worked as a kid uh, all the time. And then my parents went off the road when I was uh, like four years old, so I could go to regular school and they opened a dancing school. And then we just toured and did the act uh, in the summer or on weekends in the New York, uh, New York area and the Borscht Belt. We played Grossinger's twice a week and, uh, and all that. So I've got a, 
a varied uh, show business past, but I've never known anything else besides show business. But because they were in the circus, I had circus skills. So one of the first jobs I got in Hollywood was playing the missing link uh, in a movie called Skullduggery with Burt Reynolds. And uh, it got me into um, like the stunt community as well. But uh, I didn't want to be a stuntman. I wanted, I wanted to be an actor. But um, because I could do a lot of acrobatic type things, I used to get a lot of roles that had action in it, uh, like Pete Dragon. I did all my, I was the only one that did my own stunts uh, in Pete's Dragon. <laughs> That's my, you know, that's my early background. <laughs> you know what? I've had a number of stunt performers on here. You know, um, um, I'm still friends online uh, and still in touch with Lisa Hoyle. Are you, you familiar with her? Very, very close friend of mine. I, I love Lisa. For Lisa. I had to her whole, with her yeah. all that. She, um, Actually, she was surprised. I reached out to her for the anniversary of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, speaking of acrobatics, because uh, she was in the trapeze scene in that movie. And uh, and she didn't even know the film's anniversary was up. But I've had her on here a couple of times. And then last Christmas, I had her and Greg Anthony both on together. <laughs> because uh, who? Greg Anthony. Who's another stunt guy? Greg Anthony. Anthony. Oh, Greg Anthony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love Lisa Hoyle. You know, um, she's fun to get going. Um, I know you were at Dun Cujo, so I mean, Jean Coulter's been on here. I've heard about her uh, accident on that film. And Jean, uh, Jeannie Coulter. Coulter. Okay. And yeah, um, she was a pal of Yeah. And um, I've had Teb White on here a couple times. Who was oh, on. that's that's a a legend, Ted White. I love Ted White. Actually, I got a signed um hockey mask from Friday the thirteenth, the final chapter here from Ted White. Uh-huh. Because he played Jason in My that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of stunt guys played Jason. Uh, Tom Morga, a, yeah. a number of uh, guys played Jason. My sister, uh, Robbie uh, Morgan, was the first victim in Friday the 13th. She played Annie, the girl that got her throat slit when she was hitchhiking. Uh, She's your sister? My sister, yes. Are you kidding me? Well, I didn't I like know Annie. that. She, she's been on my show. Has she really? Yeah, <laughs> my my baby sister. I remember her telling a story about um, the great outdoors when she she got to be in the bear suit. All right, I'll tell you a story about that. I was in the bear suit for that. <clears throat> I got another job, and I said to her, um, "Excuse me." <clears throat> I said, "Rob, I got an easy job for you." One day, just got to be in the bear suit. And so I brought the bear suit to her house and she put it on and she put the head on and she freaked out. She, I can't do this. I can't. She was so claustrophobic. She, I said, Rob, it's a sag daily. It's an easy job. You know what I mean? She freaked out. So we got the thing and it turned out she didn't have to have the head on for the scene because they just needed her to slap Dan Aykroyd on the back in the bear suit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so she did. She actually did the job without having to put the head on. But it was somebody, she goes, I don't know how you do this. This is so claustrophobic. <laughs> wow, I had no idea Robbie was your sister. <laughs> what a small world. Yeah. She talked about, uh, you know, um, dancing and whatnot. And it's funny because she said she could uh, handstand and I'm like, I said to her, I said, did you see Friday the 13th part three? Because there was a guy that was killed on uh, doing a handstand. <laughs> she hadn't yeah. seen it. Oh, wow. Well, you learn something new every day. I had no idea Robbie Morgan was your sister. <laughs> she was a delight to have on here. Oh, yeah. Robin's fun. She's a good interview. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, we wow. still dance. She she teaches tap class. I, you know, and she lives not far from me. And uh, and her son's getting married next week. Oh wow. So. That is wow. What a small world. I had no idea. And you know what? She may have even mentioned you in the interview. For all I know, I did that. I think it was 2017. I think I had her on. Uh -huh. Wow. I'm going to wow. call her when we're done and, and tell her. <laughs> that is so cool. You know, well, I tried to have her come back on here, you know, and it, and for whatever reason, it did never get scheduled. But, um, but um, no, I think, I think it's awesome that, uh, that, um, wow, what a small world. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie leaping out of that Jeep. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've had uh, Dick Warlock's been on here, another stunt guy. Yeah. So I I've had a number of stunt people come on here, you know, and uh, and tell their stories and and wow, okay, that is very cool. <laughs> but um, one film I want to ask my, you, huh? I was saying, and my daughter is a fam a famous creature in, in movies. She is a uh, my daughter's a contortionist, and uh -huh. she uh, is the girl in the ring two and three. She's Samara in the ring. Was she not in the first one? No, the first one was a 10-year-old girl. And then in the second one, she created that spider crawl that crawls out of the well. And uh, then she did, two, so she did two and three as Samara. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember yeah. you and I talking about that. So, uh, yeah, you guys got this in your blood. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I seen, um, I didn't see the ring three in the theater. I saw the first two in the theater. So I, yeah. so I definitely saw her in the second one. Does she crawl out of your TV? <laughs> she, she actually uh, did a prank uh, when they were opening the movie. They put a, a, like a TV uh, store, like, you know, where you go buy TVs and they had people come in and she crawled out of the well and it got something like 400 million hits uh, on that prank as Samara. So <laughs> interesting. Yeah, she's somebody I got to get on here too at some point, you know hopefully though she won't crawl through my computer screen <laughs> you never know <laughs> wow i did not know the robbie morgan connection though wow that is fantastic yeah. must have been a blast in your family growing up well you know our mom had a dancing school and uh and we were all in show business my brother and sister are both on broadway and uh that's that's what we did that was the family business so well i know but a lot of kid out but we had a happy childhood i mean i uh my dad was great fun and uh a lot of uh, a lot of kid actors had a hard time you know growing up because you get to an age where you don't work you know you're not working and you feel like a has been at 14 you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, but we all kind of weathered through it and uh we're all very close. It's great. So, yeah. Well, talking to Lisa Hoyle, um, I, I asked her, I said, uh, who's your favorite person to double for? And um, she said, Christina Applegate, you know, and, and, um, and I know Christina Applegate's been having a few health issues, unfortunately, but, uh, but she loved Christina and she'd talk about that. Who is your favorite person to double for? Well, I've doubled Martin Short a lot, uh, and I, uh, and Martin's such a sweet guy. Uh, I I would probably have to say that it would be Martin. You know, just you know, great relationship, and we're pat. You know, he, he, that I would have to say is my favorite person. There you go. I've heard you good know, things. Double, and and I doubled Baryshnikov, and Baryshnikov is still a pal of mine. And uh, I doubled him in two, uh, t uh, we did, I danced with him in two TV specials and I was his stunt double in the second one. So uh, that go. was, that was great fun too. There you go. 
Well, one film I have to ask you about you're uncredited for is Wait Until Dark. Now, I um, w- when people passed away, I do tribute interviews. And I did have uh, Audrey Hepburn's eldest son on here back in 2017, that year. <laughs> and um, and uh, I heard all about uh, what um, Audrey Hepburn was like as a real person, which was really cool. Wait Until Dark was a really great thriller. And, of course, who could forget Alan Arkett playing um, uh, that standout villain in it. Um, and, of course, uh, you make an appearance. And you you want to talk about uh, being being part of that movie? Uh, it was uh, 1967. Mel Ferrer was the director who was mm-hmm. uh, married to Audrey. And... Uh, <coughs> It was just that scene on the stoop where the uh, the killers are looking for her apartment. And uh, I got I just mouth off to him, just a punk kid. And I had a little scene with Richard Crenna and Jack Weston. And interestingly enough, the little kid that was sitting um, next to me was my little brother. And my father brought him to the set with me. I was 17. And uh, the director said, oh, that would be cute. Put, sit, sit him on the stoop next to you. So it was actually me and my little brother. Uh, and that I've got stills from that that are kind of fun. So why so wasn't not, why wasn't Robbie in there? <laughs> Robbie was a baby when we shot that. <laughs> so you guys were going to go. Yeah. yeah, you. I'm not going to tell you how old. You can't <laughs> figure out how old you are, but uh, but yeah, she was a little kid. Anyway, just. A small scene in that, and uh, it was fun. That was still in New York. And then I worked with Alan Arkin again in a movie called Poppy, uh, which was a really lovely little heartwarming film directed by uh, Arthur Hiller. And uh, I played the leader of a Puerto Rican gang that beat up Alan Arkin. And uh, one of the kids in my gang, kind of like when my little brother was Alan Arkin's uh, son, Adam. And uh, he came to the set with Alan. He said, put him in your gang. So uh, Alan Arkin's son was one of the uh, the gang members that beat him up. <laughs> That's funny. And Adam Arkin is a big director now. Adam, mm-hmm. uh, Adam's a director, so I should call him up. See if I can get a job. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, did. I'm wondering, did, was, he, was he the... He did a couple uh, episodes of The Office. You know, the new yeah, I'm wondering about um, I'm wondering about some of the films, but I might be getting them mixed up with somebody else. But but anyway, um, you mentioned earlier Burt Reynolds, and of course you did Fuzz. Yeah. <laughs> we lost Burt. Um, I remember I had um, um, Susie Ewing on from Smokey and the Bandit, and she played Hot Pants. And at the time, Burt was still alive, and uh, now he has since gone and uh burt reynolds of course was a somebody i grew up watching uh i've heard very good things about him uh what was your experience like with him burt was an interesting character because i did a movie with him in uh one of his first features uh it's called skullduggery in Mm -hmm. jamaica not a very good film and it didn't do what he thought it was going to do for his career but Bert was, you know, he was all right, but he was kind of, Bert was one of the few people that when, once he became a star, he got nicer. A lot of people, when they become stars, they become jerks. Bert was the opposite. You know, I think he was so desperate to be, you know, uh, he was like, you know, kind of slugging through television series and all that. Once he became a star, like when we did fun, he became the nicest guy in the world, you know? Um, that that's my comment on on Bert. So I, I always enjoyed him. You know, Bert was uh Bert was fun and love stunt people. Uh you know, he was like a football player in college or something and very active, did a lot of his own stuff. And uh but Fuzz was interesting because I lit him on fire. I threw gasoline on him and lit him on fire. And then I lit a uh, Yule Brenner on fire. It was me and this other kid that was with me my gang was was charlie martin smith who was towed in american graffiti oh uh, yep i know who he then, is yep <laughs> and then he, be, he became a big director 
but anyway, that was, and then Bert, I remember he brought Dinah Shore to the set because he was dating Dinah Shore at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was so excited to meet Dinah Shore. So, uh, and then I, I would see Bert, you know, um, like socially uh, different things. And we go to the theater or whatever, but anyway, sweet guy. Is there, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but uh, I just wonder if there's anybody you didn't care to double for. Well, there's a couple of people I doubled that, you know, that weren't very fun. Anymore. But, you know, I don't, I like to talk about the guys that were fun, not the guys okay. that were I, I, I hear you. I hear you. I get it. I get it. I get it. Well, I'll tell you, I have heard some great stories. You mentioned the great outdoors. I've heard them such wonderful stories about John Candy. Like I've heard at least two people say that he's one of these people that they'll ask you what your trailer is like. And then uh, he'll make sure you're hooked up with the best one. (laughs) He was such a sweet guy. Uh, When we were doing the great outdoors, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles had come out. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was just gushing you know, to him that, you know, how wonderful he was and how, it, how it touched me, you know, um, and he was just such a sweet guy. It went, uh, very few, you know, actors here died. I wept when he died. It was like such, such a loss, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but John Candy, anything you've ever heard about him, any wonderful thing is true. He was a sweet man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? We got to talk about the, the phenomenon that was, um, Logan's Run. I mean, that came out the year before Star Wars. And of course, it, uh, you know, I well, always like. Of... Huh? It came out a few years before Star Wars. It came out the year that I was shooting uh, Pete's Dragon, actually. Uh, we had the same wardrobe guy. But how I got that was the same producer that produced Skullduggery with Burt Reynolds that I did when I was 18. It was the same producer. And I had stayed friends with him throughout it. And when um, Logan's run was cast, he just brought me in. He just said, you know, I want you to do it. Cause you know, I did that slide down the thing um, uh, as, as an entrance. And he knew that I, I did action well. So, uh, and then because of Logan's run, George Lucas saw it and brought me in to, to play Luke Skywalker. And I remember I had two auditions uh, with him and, uh, at a screen test uh, to play Luke, but nobody knew what it was. It was a silly little test script. And, you know, um, I had no idea of nobody had any, he didn't have any idea what it was going to become. But so that's my claim to fame. I, uh, I tested for it. And then years later, I saw him at the, um, I think it was the 50th or 75th anniversary of Warner Brothers that had a big show and a big deal. And I was there. And he was talking with Steven Spielberg. And I went up to him and I said, you know, George, I'm Gary Morgan. You test me for Luke Skywalker. And he goes, oh, yeah, I remember you. And I went, that's very sweet of you to say, I don't think so. By then, it was like, you know, many years passed. He goes, no, no, I remember you. So for what, for whatever it was worth. But um, <laughs> I, never worked on, and I never worked on any of the Star Wars uh, movies. So... <laughs> And uh, like I said, I was uh, shooting Pete Stragon when uh, when Logan's Run uh, came out. But that was interesting because that was before CGI. So mm-hmm. all those Logan's Run things were all miniatures. Those were all actual. They had entire sound stages with you know with the city built in miniature with the little cars and everything. It you know it was it was quite something. They had uh, and it was the first time a hologram was ever shot on film. Yeah, <clears throat> that I've heard that. Where there's a hol- yeah, there's that one weird scene, and they had an actual hologram uh, of Logan and filmed it, and it, that was like, at the time, it was like, oh, that was a big deal. But then CGI came in, like not long after. Well, now they are um, they can CGI actors, like they did um, S- Star Wars Rogue One, and they had uh, CGI uh, Peter Cushing, you know, and. Yeah. Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, for whatever reason, they did that with Laurence Olivier. And um, I'm like, wow, is this go like, it's coming dangerously close to we can replace actors. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have to be careful if you're too if you're too much of a problem we'll just cgi you yeah we don't need uh, you anymore <laughs> yep yep but but nonetheless logan's run it you could play that as a devil billing along with something like say blade runner or brazil you know and it it would fit right yeah. in you know it's like one of those uh, futuristic movies had an interesting premise to it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, I work at the hospital here as a, as a cleaner. So when I, cause of course the whole story behind Logan's run is that you're only allowed to live till you're 21, you know? So they didn't know anything. 30. Of, oh, is it th oh, 30. 30. I'm sorry. 30 where did i get 21 from but i don't know but I, it just took nine years off of my life before my uh before my crystal turns red <laughs> there you go but of course everybody got to live in pleasure yeah now we you know it's weird I, yeah uh in that movie um if you wanted uh to have sex you went on the circuit and these holograms would show up and you would like literally like swipe. And if you, you know, agreed on one, the girl materialized or the guy materialized or whoever it was that you wanted materialized. And they've got these, you know, these computer things now where you swipe left, right. And if you both hook up, you just meet. I went, it's like right out of Logan's run. You know, it's kind of weird because when you watch it, you went, oh, that'll never happen. And, uh, when they've got these certain um sites now that, that people just go on it's logan's run it happened today they have real dolls <laughs> yeah that, yeah you know funny with real dolls because the first time i saw a real doll i was on a set and they had a real doll um that they were using for stunts and we used to you know make these dummies to throw off buildings or or do things that that would kill a stunt person. You know, that mm -hmm. used to be stunt dummies. And I was on a set and there was a real doll because they were gonna like take this doll by the ankles and smash it into like a windshield. You know what I mean? It looked like the person got hit. And uh, somebody said, lift up her skirt. She's like anatomically correct. I went, what is this? And somebody said, it's a real doll. You know, I, because I, I walked in and went, wow, that's a, that's a great stunt dummy, you know, really. You know, it looks it looks human. You know, <laughs> that was that was my introduction to that. And they still use them. They use real dolls in stunts. You know, um, like I said, you know, throwing it in front of a, a train, or when you actually see it get hit, if they don't want to CGI it, you know, they'll they'll hit a real doll. I did a TV show once. This is funny, mm -hmm. and I was it was uh, Mike Mike and Molly, and uh, I was it was a stunt job. I was a dead person on a gurney that uh that molly bumps into and knocks me to the ground and this is my favorite phone call they said we were going to use a dummy but we figured a stunt person was cheaper so i got the job because i was cheaper than the than the dummy <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny you know um <laughs> yeah that's get dangerously close when dummies are being paid more <laughs> but uh but nonetheless, you know, Robbie Morgan now today could have a, a, a real doll be in the bear suit. Yeah, no, she had to she had to slap him on the back. So it could have been that. But they, you know, now and the CGI is so good. They use, you know, CGI bears and CGI lions. And you know what I mean? So uh, they don't have to do that. But I did. Like when I did Cujo, I did all the attack scenes uh, with the star. So if you saw the mm -hmm. star attacked, it was me in the dog suit. Um, and like, but I did um, Back to the Future three uh, mm -hmm. in the in the I was I was the bear in the cave. So they had a real bear that is attacking the trainer. But when you see like Michael J. Fox and you know the bear stands up, it's over the shoulder. It's mm -hmm. it's me in the suit. So that's what they would use like real animals and but now they're cgiing them so um, it really kind of cut the uh you know the real animal out of the out of the picture so well let's talk a little bit about um pete's dragon because like i said i was five years old and i saw that at the drive-in theater and 
That came out in 1977, the same year as Star Wars. A lot of great movies come out that year. Saturday Night Fever, Smoking the Bandit, uh, Argento Suspiria. Uh, I could probably think of some more. Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, God, well, you know. Pete's Dragon, you know, when we finished shooting, it didn't wasn't released for a while because they had to do the animation. So it was a lot of post-production, you know, after we finished shooting it. So um, I was doing a movie called Matilda. Uh, about a boxing kangaroo with Robert Mitchum and Elliot Gould. I was in the kangaroo suit. Mm -hmm. So I was shooting Matilda when Pete Dragon premiered at uh, Radio City Musical. But Pete Dragon was probably my favorite movie that I ever worked on. It was Disney. It was all these old stars. Um, the choreographer was a, a woman named Anna White who did, who got an Oscar for Oliver. And she was an old Broadway uh, dancer and choreographer. <clears throat> and I was on it. I took the job as a dancer. They, uh, I was, they needed an acrobat, you know, dance for some of the scenes. And uh, I remember saying to my wife, I was like kind of bummed, you know, I got the job and it was a good job. You know, um, as a dancer, you're, you're making uh, sag wages, like, like as if you were an actor. And um, let me get back to, okay. Uh, so I took the job as what they call a skeleton dancer. They get a skeleton crew of like six dancers and they work out all the choreography for all the dance numbers in the entire movie on the skeleton crew. You know, you learn it, all the dances, the kids, no matter what. And then later on, when the actors come in, you teach it to the actors. So um, I had worked at Disney before. So I went to the casting director who was a friend of mine and I went, let me play one of the brothers because I saw the, the script. I said, you know, I could play one of the brothers. He goes, Gary, they want two oxen of men. It's, they're calling, they want two huge guys to play this. You're just not right for it. I went, oh, oh well. So when they were auditioning all the big guys, I was doing the dance in front of them to help them audition, you know, because I knew the, the dance routine. I was one of the skeleton dancers. So I was doing it kind of in front of them. And after many, many, many actors that they saw for the role. Uh, the producer was watching me do it. And he went, Gary does it great. And he could do his own stunts. Let's have Gary play the brother. And instead of two oxen, we'll do it like Mutt and Jeff. Well, big guy and little guy, it'll be funny. And uh, so I, I read for the, uh, the role to the director and he said, perfect, done. Fired as a skeleton dancer, hired as a co-star, and then got to do it with, uh, Jeff Cottaway, who was my dressing room roommate when we were nine and 10. And it was like such a full circle, you know, uh, doing that. So, and anyway. he went on to be and I was a, Yeah, yep. He went to be Kanicki. Uh, Kanicki and he Greece. Had done it on Broadway. Yep. He, well, he had done the show um, either on Broadway, you know, Greece or one of the road shows, I think. Uh, I think he played, you know, Danny Zito or what, you know, the John Travolta role. And mm -hmm. then he did Kinnicky in the movie. But it was so fun. It was Red Buttons and Mickey Ro and Pete Stragon. Red Buttons, Mickey Rooney, uh, Jim Backus, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Dale. Yeah. Who I idolized. Great story. I'm the real physical comedy, you know, stage actor uh, who I just adored. And, um, uh, it was so fun and Helen Reddy was a sweetheart and it was just such a wonderful and in six months at Disney Studios, it was a, like a dream job, you know, and and doing a musical, like an old fashioned musical where we rehearsed it and, and shot it. And it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Um, and it turned out to be a, a, a good picture too. I get people all the time like you saying, oh my God, that was uh, my childhood, you know, movie that I watched over and over again. So great fun. You know, it, it's funny because um, I was at my brother's apartment. Of course, we grew up with Pete's Dragon, of course, and he would have been one when Pete's Dragon comes out. So I don't think he was at the drive-in when we were at that. But here's the funny thing is that... Um, <laughs> They talk about stuff that they can't do in movies today. And um, 
Pete's Dragon, of course, opens with this song called The Happiest Home in These Hills. And I get a laugh out of that song because it's like the happiest song about child abuse you could ever want listen to. <laughs> like you've got um, uh, Shelly Winters and he goes, I know if I see him, I won't miss him with this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We're gonna bring them up and gonna lynch them, and we're gonna, you know, boil them in all whatever the, the lyrics are. It's, yeah, it's terrible. We were chasing this little kid who who my mom bought for like fifty cents uh, to work the farm. You know, it, I know this, but it's a Disney villain. You know, so. Oh, it's go. a great song. It looks like the four of you <laughs> had a blast doing that. You know, because I oh, yeah. mean, yeah, it was, I mean, you can't take it seriously. Of course, Shelly Winters playing this over the top villain and she's great, you know, and, um, and uh, <laughs> I like it when, of course, when, you know, Jeff Conaway's in the mud, thanks to an invisible Elliot, the dragon. And then you're laughing and you, you get knocked in, but you don't just get knocked into the mud. You end up there head down. Oh, yeah. I did a one of, and a half summer storm into yeah. the mud on my head. But we did it with wires. and uh, But I, I was good on wires. So I went, what if I did a, a one and a half flip head first? You know, they went, well, if you're willing to try that. So uh, we worked it out. And it was funny. Yep. And um, so that was a great little sequence, you know um hilarious um i gotta ask did you see the remake of pete's dragon you know i actually did not see it uh i saw a couple of clips of it and uh, it wasn't at all you know the, the same movie or anything and you know i i i really never saw it to, to be quite honest uh it wasn't very good and it didn't go anywhere and it was but it was robert redford you know and, you want me uh, to be frank with you <laughs> Yeah. I thought the remake was really, really good because it wasn't the same story. They actually took okay. and they made their own movie and <clears throat> they didn't have musical numbers in it, but they took it and they made it their own. And I was like, okay, I can respect that. You know, uh, you have Bryce Dallas Howard, of course, who actually looks like she could be, uh, Helen Reddy's uh, daughter, really, but I actually um, liked what the remake did. I think it didn't try to, well, let's remake this. No, it's like we can't do the 1977 film. Let's try to make our own thing. And they did. I was quite pleased that they went that route. Well, yeah, they, they, you know, they they do that in movies. They took the character and just made a new story that had nothing to do with the first one. But mm -hmm. you're right, which it's all for better, yeah. for worse. Uh, there you go. But <clears> anyway, I should you, watch it. I, people I, ask me all the time. <laughs> I'm going to be frank. I, I and, and, and I'm usually hard on remakes, but um. You get a few that actually measure up, like the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers is one that comes to mind that was a worthy follow-up, you know, to the original. And um, Pete's Dragon actually did have an... I was actually... come. I came away surprised that because it could have been a train wreck, and it was better than I thought it was going to be. But uh, okay. Robert Redford wasn't playing Mickey Rooney in it, you know, like, I guess he's just playing a, his own character, you know, so it was, I like what they did there. But anyway, you mentioned Jim Dale. Now, I love the carry on films. I, like he, he was a nose, you know, uh, carry on Cleo and all of those. And um, one of the scenes and my brother and i caught this clip on youtube and i said to my brother I said remember this and of course was when um they were trying to harpoon elliot he and red buttons and 
red buttons as guys hands over his eyes and then he kind of looks down he sees a rope is around jim dale's foot and he has to point on a jim dale sees it and does that physical comedy thing and then that thing shoots and uh goes up in the the sky and you just see his body and you hear the goofy the sound that goofy makes in the disney uh <laughs> cartoons <laughs> he's in the sky and that still makes me laugh you know and um and Jim Dale, until I spoke to you on the phone, I didn't know he was still around. I'm I'm actually going to see if I can get him to come on here. I'd love to hear his stories. But what was your experiences like with him? And are you still in touch with him? Uh, I'm not. He did uh, Barnum on Broadway that my sister Robbie was in. <clears throat> so she uh, and then went on the road, uh, you know, the national tour with Jim. So uh I was friends with him like through Barnum and all that because um, I was actually going to do Barnum, but it was uh, there was no real roles that I could have done. And uh, but I adore Jim Dale. Like I said, he told me, regaled me with stories of, of, of physical stuff that he did. He also did a show called Scapino on Broadway, which was basically a commedia dell'arte. And uh, and he was very talented. He played, you know, uh, played guitar and sang and he actually wrote the song Georgie Girl from the movie. Uh, I, I adore Jim Dale. I would love to get in touch with Jim Dale. Um, the years later, I went to uh, to England and, and met up with him and he took us around and took us to the theater. Um, just a sweet, fun guy, but very vaudeville. Jim Dale is like, you know, like a vaudeville performer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just really one of the most talented guys and the nicest guy that you, you ever want to work with, you know? So he was one of my, uh, my favorite people. That's one of the reason I would love to go to work on Pete's Dragon was to hang out with Jim Dale. Well, he and Red Buttons were a great uh, combination, had great chemistry there but, as the villain and the sidekick, but, but, you know? But they were. But they were, and he didn't realize it because he hadn't seen the Disney film. I said, you know, you're the fox and the cat from Pinocchio. He goes, well, what do you mean? I went, even your clothes. So we were in the commissary one day and I picked up, they, you know, they have all these books in the commissary, uh, all the Disney, you know, thing. And I picked up the book on Pinocchio and I showed him, I went, look, it's you and, and red buttons. And then he looked at the movie and it was exactly those two characters. Um, in the, the Pinocchio, the Disney's Pinocchio, um, the fox and the cat. It was was uh, was Doc Terminus and uh, Red Buttons. But let me tell you a story. You said you liked that, that when he went up through the roof, that almost <laughs> killed the stunt guy that did it. Guy oh. named John Moyo. He was doubling uh, Jim Dale. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they had uh, a cable going up through the, the roof of the, the set, like into the soundstage. They had a fake roof. And he had rings on his body and a harness that were attached to the, the cable. So literally they had, a, they had the rope around his leg, went up through the, the roof and they had it on a, like a winch that just jerked him up through the roof. You know what I mean? On the cable. And um, everybody went, they did it and it went perfectly, went right through the roof. And everywhere, okay. And then people are like starting to like, you know, do other things. And the the cable that was holding him up there snapped. And he started to come back down the cable head first onto the concrete stage floor. And he was picking up speed and nobody even noticed. And he's a pal of mine, John Moyo. He was the stunt coordinator in the movie. And he was trying to grab the cable and stop himself, but he was going too fast. And Literally at the last minute, one of the special effects guys, this big guy saw him coming, ran across the stage, threw himself under like the guy and John Murray hit him, hit the stunt guy, uh, the special effects guy in the chest. That guy went to the ground and they both went to the ground and literally saved the stuntman's uh, life because he would have broken his neck. He was coming very fast, head first. And uh, that was from that scene. You know, the stunt went fine. It was the aftermath that uh, that was the problem. So that's an oh. inside story. Nobody knows that story. Who was the special effects guy? Do you remember? 
Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember who it was. He, you know, just one of the special effects guys that was working on it. And he saw John slide down and, uh, you know, last moment threw himself uh, in front of him and, uh, and saved him. What a great guy. So, you yeah. know, I, I love moments like that where, um, where people just, they, they think about other people. And uh, I think that was one, that's a wonderful story. I'm glad I'm glad that worked out that way, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Um Helen Reddy, you know. Uh in this movie I have images of her doing that song but kicking the beer bugs off of the couch or at the saloons. <laughs> when she uh, that, that was a great dance number with her you know and of course she did brazzle dance a day and all that i'll tell you uh, an inside story about that that nobody knows mm -hmm. uh we worked out all that choreography on the barrel before i was playing the brother i was one of the skeleton dancers they had these barrels uh on an electric uh like a winch that you know that was on a, a gimbal and you know the barrel was on a thing that they could make the barrel go around at yep. a controlled speed so we could dance on it and uh i said what if she and i did these tap steps on it and i went that's amazing you think we can get helen to do it so we got helen in and helen learned how to do that little dance step on the on the barrel well on a white when we were shooting it you know the, the set was all decorated da, 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 you know and helen's doing this and did it great and the Anna White, the choreographer, said to the director, let me look through the camera. I want to see what your frame line is. And um, this was before now. It's all on video. You could just walk over to Video Village and see what the camera sees. You know, but this wasn't then. And the, the director went, you choreograph it. I'm the director. Let, you know, she said, I want to see what frame line you've got on that. And he wouldn't let her. So we go to Daly's and they didn't have a shot of Helen Reddy head to toe on the barrel. They had shots of her face. They had shots of her feet on the barrel, but they never got a shot of a full Helen Reddy on that barrel dancing. And Anna White freaked out. She said, it looks like you got a stunt person doing it. She goes, I'll be damned if I spent all these weeks teaching Helen Reddy how to dance on the barrel and you're not going to show it. And she went to the producer and made him re- decorate the set because this was you know days later the set was all taken apart. made him put the set back get the barrel there and do that one shot so in the movie there's a shot yep of um wait let me get rid of this well it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, anyway, um because so fred astaire <clears throat> you often see when he dances full body because he didn't want people to think it wasn't him, you know? Sure. So but that I was the that. deal. Yeah. And Anna got, that was Anna's shot. So that, you know, got it to do it. Well, was uh, Helen nervous about doing that or what you just. Helen was great. Yeah. Helen was a, ter a terrific lady. Um, the reason I got Helen ready is the, the guy that wrote the music was a guy named Al Kasha. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a partner, Al Kasha and Joel Hirshhorn. Mm -hmm. um, they were campaigning for like some kind of a rock star because they wanted a hit single out of one of the movies. So they, uh, at first they were pitching um, Anne Margaret to play the role and all these different people. And they were going, no, 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 we want like a pop star so we could get a hit record. You know what I mean? If you get a hit record, you could often win the Oscar. You know, like they won Oscars for um, The Towering Inferno and uh, The Poseidon Adventure because they had a pop star singing the theme. So I Am Woman was a huge hit at the time. So they, he won, so they got Helen ready to do it. By the time the movie came out, she was not a star anymore. The, the, she didn't have another hit. And I Am Woman was yesterday's news, and they did not get uh, the uh, the hit single that they wanted uh, out of, uh, I think, Candle on the Water was, you know, that they were hoping for. Doesn't matter. Uh, 
So it kind of backfired on him that way. But Helen, Helen was great. Nope, she was game. She was ready to do anything. Um, sweet lady. I was sorry we lost her as well, you know, mm-hmm. young. So about Mickey Rorick, uh, Rooney. Mickey Rooney is exhausting. Mickey <laughs> Rooney just wants to tell stories and you got to watch him. And he's telling stories. And Helen, <laughs> Shelly Winters go, I can't take it anymore. Because he'd just be sitting around. And I loved it because he's telling all these old Hollywood stories, but he had a lot of energy, you know, and he wanted you to look at him. And if you weren't paying attention, you know, he would like, you know, like back to me. <laughs> Mickey Rooney was a character just, uh, and I hung out with him a lot. He was telling me all these stories about, you know, different wives and all of that, you know, like real personal stuff. And uh, Judy Garland. So I, you know, <laughs> all that, you know, they were, they were pals, you know. So Mickey Rooney was great. And so was Red Buttons. You know, Red Buttons called me Boy Chick. Because uh, <laughs> he was he was a Borscht Belt comic as well. So uh, I had a little, you know, background uh, that that Red loved. So, you know, they, they were, those are the icons of, uh, you know, old movies and stuff. So, so, uh, so what was it like having uh, Shelly Winters as a mom? Did, did you, did you uh, send her a card every uh, Mother's Day like you're supposed to? <laughs> well, I got to say, we stayed friends after that. Uh, but Shelly Winters was such a dreadful pain in the ass <laughs> on that movie. She, you know, she had that old star thing that she was still holding on to. And at, at one point, uh, she, she was just such, such a problem on the set. You know what I mean? Walking off the set, and throwing a tantrum and leaving. And uh, the, she thought it was too far to walk from the, the stage door all the way to the set. So she, she got a wheelchair and she made somebody push her around the so she didn't have to walk too far. Just crazy. Just, old thing and one day she walked off the set because they had the air conditioning on and you know we were in the mud and she thought it was whatever it doesn't matter but all of a sudden all the brass was there i mean the head of the studio and the producer and the director and they were throwing names around like Kay ballard martha ray all these people they were talking about replacing shelly with and uh the director took Shelley in his dressing room and said, Shelley, darling, he was uh, from Australia. Shelley, darling, yeah, you know, what you're doing is really wonderful. What you're on screen is just exactly what we want. But you're such a dreadful pain in the ass that we've got to fire you because if you pull this crap later on, we won't be able to reshoot it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they fired her. And she said, I'll be good. He goes, uh, we can't trust it. We can't take that chance because right now we're only two weeks into it. And we could reshoot your stuff. And she begged and pleaded and promised to be good. And they kept her. And she was good for most of it. And then she started pulling crap later on. And the director just wasn't having it. He just wasn't going to cater to her bad you know, um, behavior and uh, kind of pushed it through and they kept her. But there was that moment where they go, <laughs> it's just not worth, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, the bad behavior. So uh, anyway, I stayed with Shelly years later. She used to call me her son. I would go to her house and, you know, bring movies over and uh, we would have lunch together. Uh, there was a little place in Hollywood called the Silver Spoon that all the old stars would go to. And, uh, but she was this, Big, loud mouth, sloppy. I went to Rome. My wife and I went to Rome. She was doing the movie and uh, visited her. And um, she took us took us around. And then she had a, a chauffeur-driven guy. She goes, I'm not using him today. Uh, I'm not using him today. But, you know, take my chauffeur and limo. And uh, anyway, there you have it. You know, my <laughs> phone is almost dying. I should plug it in. Give me a second. Sure, yeah. Because plug. give me give me one second. Yep, no problem. No problem. I'll just uh press or pause here. There we are. We're good with technology, folks. Technology. <laughs> you know, and um of course with um 
you had Jeff Conway as your brother, of course, who was in Greece. Sadly, we just lost uh, Olivia Newton-John yesterday. I was so sad to hear that. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew. I did a celebrity ski race with her one time in Aspen for a big charity that she was the head of. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent a whole week together. And I don't know how this happened, but um, during the race, and it was covered by Wide World of Sports, I was racing against her. Now, I don't, you know, I don't know why they put me against, it was like an accident. And right as we were starting the race, the guy that was starting it said to me, don't be a jerk, make it close. Because I'm a very good skier and she's barely a skier, you know what I mean? <laughs> So I stayed just even with her the whole race. And at the last minute, I just let her slip out and win. Mm -hmm. And Wide World Sports was there and they just went crazy. They went, oh my God, Olivia Newton-John just beat the stunt man. And, you know, so then they had me on. I went, she must have been sandbagging because I don't know where she got that speed, but she just smoked me, <laughs> you know? So she's so sweet. She goes, you know, she looked at me because she knew. Mm -hmm. um, she was just a sweetheart. And we talked because Jeff Conaway married her sister for a while, Rona Newton John. So wow. we talked about that because instead of Greece, she brought her sister to visit, and Jeff fell in love with, with her sister and married her. Didn't last very long, but um <laughs> so we, we had that little thing too. Yeah, I was in talks with her manager to see if I could get her on here. Uh, I've been in talks for the last couple of years, but her health was declining and uh, her manager remained optimistic. He never, ever, ever told me no. I mean, they'll go do something for the 40th anniversary of physical and stuff like that. And it just never came to fruition. When I heard that she passed away yesterday, I felt crushed because um, when you're in my position, it's, it's like, um, I try to do like uh, an honest podcast, you know, and make it entertaining and try to make the guest as pos uh, comfortable as possible. You got a lot out there in media and journalism that don't do that. And uh, Olivia would have given me a lot of clout, you know, had that worked out. But, um, but you know, they say cancer's a bitch, you know, and, and uh, the breast cancer came back and and uh, she was just a, a bright flower. You know, I grew up listening to Olivia. In fact, I think her first record, I think, came out either the year I was born or the year before I was born. Something handy like that. So I grew up uh, yeah. listening to Olivia. But, um, but of course, you got to have Jeff Conaway as, uh, as uh, your uh, brother. And, of course, Charles Tyner. Tyner as uh, <laughs> the father and uh, the four of you were just great that like I said that opening scene is great despite the subject matter it's still a fun uh, uh, dance number in the film um, yeah um, what was your favorite memory of doing Pete's Dragon oh god I don't know if I have one uh, a favorite memory. It was just, it was just a <clears throat> some of those dance numbers. You know, were were great fun as we worked it out. Uh, we had all kinds of acrobatic, you know, like bar. It, mm -hmm. it, that that was a great that number. Uh, the number of when we were doing bill of sale, uh, a, a favorite moment because we were supposed to be in this little boat going out to chase Pete. And they had the boat all set. And I and I looked at the boat and I went, no, that's it's too big. Look at this dinghy. We should all get in the dinghy. And the choreographer went, you know, what are you kidding? Uh, Shelly won't even get her big button. That little, it was a little dinghy. And I went, that will be funnier. You know what I mean? It would so, be. Um, and she's, and because they were at us in this big rowboat. And I went, no, man, let's, let's get in that one. And that was totally my idea. So we get in that boat. And uh, there was a, like a mast on it too. And we're doing the scene and Shelly is like wiggling around and water is coming in both sides of the, uh, of the boat. And it's not in the scene, but we sunk the boat. 
the boat just completely sank with all of us in it. And, you know, they fished it out, drained it. We did it again. But that was that was a, a, a really funny moment, too. Uh, you know, with, with Shelly. It was all, a lot of it was the seat of our pants, too. It was like in a rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. But the last minute, they go, look at that over there. That would be funnier, you know. And we did. We did all kinds of stuff like that. That, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So, anyway, great fun. We got to talk about Matilda. And, of course, we're not talking about the one about the magical little girl from the 1996 movie. We're talking about the kangaroo boxing movie for which you were in the kangaroo suit. Now, yeah, the cinema snob on YouTube just did a snob episode on this, you know, and um, I've had him on the show here before, and um, and I'll be frank. Until the cinema snob did this, I actually had never heard of this movie. I only knew Matilda of the uh, Mara Wilson movie directed by. I'm going to say, was that right. Danny DeVito that made that? But Well, he was, I don't know if he directed it. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> but that's Matilda funny because I watched the Cinema Snob do this um, review and I was like, Gary Morgan, I just booked him for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, well, you know, Robbie does the, the bear costume. You get you get to do the uh, you get to do the uh, kangaroo. Robbie, Robbie did the bear costume for like two seconds in it. I did the bear costume for the whole movie, uh, <laughs> but I got her in it for, for a day because I was trying to help her out. You know, to you know make a little money. Uh, you know, so on an was, easy gig. But anyway, the there was kangaroo no, no suit chance was, of her doing the kangaroo. Huh? <laughs> That was a very difficult uh, suit to work in and uh, and to make it work. A at first, they were supposed to be a real kangaroo, and I was just going to be the double, you know, um, mm -hmm. in the some of the boxing scenes, you know. Uh, but the, the real kangaroo is untrainable. Kangaroos are dumb, you know, and uh, <laughs> Al, Rudd Al Ruddy is the producer who did, you know, The Godfather. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've watched The Offer. That's an amazing, uh, you know, thing how it was made. But anyway, and uh, Al Ruddy was the big cigar chop. And don't worry, kid, it's going to be a monster. G-rated. We're going to make a fortune on this. And he got, you know, uh, Robert Mitchum and Elliot Gould and uh, a lot of gangsters from The Godfather. The guy that played Luca Brazzi was in it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, they decided they're not going to use a real kangaroo at all because it's just too hard. And too many, you know, he said, and Al Ruddy goes, nobody knows what a kangaroo looks like. Don't worry about it. Don't think this is a real kangaroo. I'm going, no, they won't. And I was going, Al, you know what you should do? You should have the kangaroo talk to the owner, like sitting reading a newspaper, like Francis the talking mule. But when anybody else comes in, he goes into like, you know, kangaroo, no, you know. I said, let the audience in on the secret because they're gonna know this is not a real kangaroo. He goes, kid. You just do the boxing scenes and leave the rest to me. He goes, don't worry about it. And then he put out a press release when the movie came out about the real kangaroo named Whammo. And he gave it to all the press. It was a big press kit about how they had to have an air conditioned man and then and about the kangaroo and how they trained it. And he said, and there was also a stunt double uh, who did some of the boxing scenes and then went back to the real kangaroo. I'm going, you can't tell the press this is a real kangaroo you know what i mean and that's what happened i mean all the reviews were like this is a you know a guy in a kangaroo suit it's obvious this is a guy in a kangaroo suit you know uh but who knows it, it was a sweet movie it was a famous novel uh by a guy named paul gallico and it was a charming uh you know book and it was a charming script but it was a guy in a kangaroo suit. There's no getting around that it's that it's not a, a real kangaroo. You know what I mean? So I think that was the a big um, reason that that it didn't do well. But there you have it. Memories of uh, Elliot Gould, Robert Mitchum, and uh, Karen Carlson. Yeah, the director is a guy named Danny Mann, Daniel Mann, mm -hmm. who's a famous, but a lot of uh, a lot of his women. Uh, 
in his movies got Oscar nominations and Oscars. And he was a sweet man. Uh, I had a lot of long lasting friendships uh, doing that movie to him being one of them. Uh, actually, um, Harold Ramis married Danny Man's daughter. So I used to see Harold Ramis at his house uh, and all that. And Al Ruddy, what a character. And I got to hang out with Robert Mitchum and I did the whole promo tour. Uh, you know, all the uh, the interviews and all that the Johnny Carson show with Robert Mitchum in the kangaroo suit. So <laughs> but what it's worth in your career, you know, you got a lot of wonderful memories. Somebody said to me, you know, when it's all said and done, all you got are memories in eight by tens. And uh, it's true. Some of them work. Some of them don't work, you know, but uh, it was a, I had a lot of fun doing a lot of movies with wonderful people. So. so you still wear the kangaroo suit? <laughs> I wish I had it. If I had it, I would it probably got thrown away somewhere. But uh, yeah, and that was the old days. Um, God, the old days. Listen to me. I was like an old man. Um, before they had these little servos that make things work, like the eyes blink and the ears twitch and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the old fashioned stuff that with these big con you know, controls inside the head. And it was done by air compression. They had a, like a scuba tank, you know, with a tube going uh, into the suit to make all that work. So the head was very heavy and it had all these um, like pulleys and rods and things inside. So, uh, you know, I would get hit by uh, accidentally like in the boxing scenes and it would like whack in there. I mean, it was, it was heavy and it was uh, cumbersome to make all that work. And I, I was hopping like, you know, down the street like a full city block and stuff mm -hmm. and there was no air exchange so you know you're doing the thing and pretty soon you're breathing your own air and you start getting light i passed out a couple of times you know uh, in some of the boxing scenes just from lack of oxygen you know so you so. weren't going to be competing with uh stallone and rocky and uh de niro and raging <laughs> bull you weren't go you weren't going to be doing that <laughs> <laughs> You know, you were in the final countdown, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Played a helicopter crewman. Martin Sheen is a, a like my older brother. Uh, I know Martin since I'm 10 years old. We did uh, some live television. Uh, and uh, he was the star of that. And uh, I, I was just with the helicopter crewman. And uh, this did stunt again. You know, they got me because I could do my own stunts. And uh, in that and that was a, that was also a, a great fun shoot you know on an aircraft carrier and with all the jet jockeys it, you know another big adventure film and of course the devil and max uh devil and um and of course you know the elephant in the room of course bill cosby was in that and of course unfortunately bill has become a controversial figure but uh Back then, you know, we didn't know about that stuff. What were your memories of him? I had no memories of him. I had a very small part in it. I wasn't even on the set with him. Uh, ah. But another uh, a Disney film that I do was called North Avenue Irregulars. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the same writers that did the music for Pete's Dragon. And there was ah. a little rock band in called Shorty and the Shortcake. And it was a uh, uh, it was a, like a church movie about, you know, this pastor and, and all that. And he hires this local rock band to do it. And Disney wanted to make us like the monkeys. They were, they got some of the rocks, the, the guys that were in my gang, in my group were famous rock and roll, you know, um, like the keyboard player for Elton John and the drummer for whatever these bands were. And they were going to give us our own TV series and uh, a record and like they did with the monkeys and then put us on the road to promote the film and to have a, like another monkeys, but never materialized, uh, unfortunately. So that would, you know, you get things in, in your life to go, oh, this is gonna make me a, a star or this is gonna make me, you know, whatever. Um, and didn't, didn't happen. But, you know, when you look back and you're like, my daughter always says to me, you know, Dad, shut up. You live in a castle on top of the hill in Laurel Canyon. Your wife and children adore you, you know, and I, I've had a wonderful life and career and I never got to be a big star, but I could still go to the grocery store. 
you know, and I made plenty of money and had a lot of fun. And that's my hope fix on it, on it all. Cause I, a lot of guys that, um, that I was acting with at the time that, oh my God, this one got a big part in a movie and oh my God, how got, and then you look at them and, you know, three wives later, you know, <laughs> miserable and broke. And you got to look at your life, you know, when you get on the other end of it and go, you know what? It was a wonderful life, like my favorite, you know, Capra movie. You know, it's a oh, wonderful that's a life. great yeah. movie. I love It's a yeah, Wonderful I, Life. That's my favorite movie. And uh, you had, look back and go. I had Caroline Grimes on from It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I just um, did read about her. Yeah. Zuzu. Yep. I had her on here, which was wonderful, you know. Um, yeah. You were in Outrageous Fortune, and you were just talking yep. about Outrageous Fortunes. <laughs> yeah, with Bet, Bet and Shelley Bet. Long. That was another yep. fun On location, uh, Arthur Hiller, who I had worked for, on, uh, who did directed a, a bunch of things. I did Poppy, a, a number of things, and we were friends. Uh, I stayed friends with Arthur Hiller. He was the president of the uh, Academy for a long time. He directed Love Story and uh, and all that and that too that was uh, that was a kick you know bit midler and shelly long group, a lot of st stories about that and we shot it in santa fe and uh and albuquerque and that was just another f great fun shoot and i was the uh, fbi guy uh cia that chased the girls all through the airports and everything trying to you know uh try to get them you know, and you were in a movie that I actually saw in the theater, and it's also celebrating its 25th anniversary. And I like the premise of this film because, you know, I grew up with, of course, my dad and uncles that liked to fish. And, of course, I saw Gone Fishing at the theater, and I was like, this is a, a familiar, that uh, this is a premise that... Uh, I could kind of relate to, you know, and, uh, and um, I saw that in the theater and I could tell those people in the audience that were fishermen. <laughs> they, they got to go, go off and go fishing and drink beer. Uh, which picture is that? You're talking about gone fishing? Gone fishing. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was another, stunt acting job I, I i just played a um gas station attendant uh in that that they at the end he throws a, a cigarette out and the pool of gasoline blows up and i was just standing on the edge of it as the thing blew up so they wanted a, a you know a stunt guy a stunt actor that could play the role and not you know freak out when <laughs> when the gasoline explodes in front of you and i knew joe pesci uh, before, uh, because he's a friend of Varishnikov's, mm -hmm. funny enough. So I had met him socially many times with Misha, so it, it was fun on the set. Well, you... Yeah. I talked to you about a lot of the films that you acted in and did stunts, and you've got so many that you did stunts in, and it's such a long list here. Um, so I'll break it down this way. Talk about oh, you don't, want to, you don't talk, want to talk about all all my stunts. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well I'll you, some of the icon. I'll tell you the iconic ones. Uh, Back mm -hmm. to the Future Two. I did all the hoverboard stunts in Back to the Future Two uh, as Biff's gang, and we did all the uh, research and development and how to make it look like we we're really on hoverboards. You know, uh, for that sequence. Um, so that that was a fun one, and we were on that for I was on that for quite a while, figuring out you know uh, all the R and D uh, on that. So uh, you need to a, do uh, you need to get in the kangaroo suit and do the hoverboard. There you go. Back to the Future Two. I mean, we're approaching twenty twenty five. I I think it got it wrong, just like Blade Runner got twenty nineteen wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It didn't happen like that, but uh we don't have flying cars, but uh no. 
could you it's, I think it was Roger Ebert pointed this out. Could you imagine the traffic flying <laughs> 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 cars? So um here's a question I asked Teb White and I'm gonna ask you. Um what's the most dangerous stunt you've done? High falls are usually, you know, the the one that could kill you if you miss, you know. Um the crash through the courthouse window in Back to the Future 2 turned out, started out as not that big of a deal, but it turned out, you know, uh, it almost killed one of the girls in it just because the way it was rigged, it wasn't, you know, uh, there was, there was, there was just problems in it that, uh, but that turned out to be a, a dangerous, a dangerous stunt. There's always a calculated risk. You look at it and you know, you know, this could go wrong, that could go wrong, and you try to prepare everything you can. And uh, the most dangerous ones, you know, usually high falls because um, it'll kill you or um, car hits, you know, you get hit by your car, you know, injury, you know, um, a lot of guys get burned doing, you know, fire gags. Uh, I've done a number of fire gags, but it's never been the thing that I, you know, uh, do a lot of because the guys that do those all the time end up getting burned. You know what I mean? I uh, was uh, sad when I saw the. Of course, I'm glad she survived, but of course, the story on uh, Lisa Hoyle, who they oh, were oh, actually yeah. reading her last rites, and uh, and she oh, yeah. uh, she survived, you know. And that's but, one of those stunts that was not not dangerous, not big. It was just, and a lot of times the little ones that are not that dangerous, you don't prepare for as much because you go, oh, this is this is nothing. And it was just a little, uh, you know, they didn't uh, they didn't tell her at, at the time that, you know, you do all these takes, the car slides into something, slides and they go, and they go, on this one, the car's actually going to hit it. And they tell the stunt people all around, and this is the one where the car's going to hit it. So you prepare for it. And they didn't tell Lisa and her friend, and uh, she ended up um, hitting her head on the sidewalk, you know, and they bounced off the car. Yeah, and she could have died. And she could have ended up as a vegetable and it was a miracle. And um, a lot of people prayed for her and uh, miraculously she, she's good. She's whole, she's working again, you know. I but that was not even a big dangerous stunt. That was one of those little things. And a lot of times the little ones are the ones that end up you know, hurting you because you know, you don't think it's, it's not, it's nothing. This is going you know, to, this is an easy one. And you let your guard down and, that's what happened with Lisa. So, uh, but thank God she's okay and uh, still with us and playing with us. So, do you uh, have you ever been injured doing a stunt? Oh, sure. You get banged up. I had eighteen orthopedic surgeries. You know, um, stuff happens. You know what I mean? But not even big injuries. You know, you tore, tear your knee, you tear your shoulder. You you know, you land on something and you herniate your back. Just you know. Not even big and you do a fire gag and you know you burn your hands and you're at the burn ward. They don't even talk about it. so many of the times I'll be on location, I'm laying on my back looking at yet another emergency room ceiling while they're stitching you up. You know what I mean? But that's not even big injuries. That just goes with the territory of doing stunts, you know, and uh, and you know going in, you know, you could get injured and you get injured and you don't sue the company, you don't make a big deal. It's just a calculated risk when you do it. So. Were you there the there day you that uh, Gene uh, Coulter was uh, the oh, accident? yeah, I was wow. right there. You betcha. Mm. What happened was Gene was uh, in Cujo, the dog was attacking uh, her. And she had this like uh, like a leather piece on her neck with a rag on it. And the dog was going for the rag, you know what I mean? And then shakes her. It looked like the dog was attacking her, you know, grabbing her neck. And take after take after take. And what they pulled the dog off and she just sat up and the dog was trying to grab the, the rag again. And it caught her nose and tore her nose off. I mean, lifted the whole, and, uh, went and you know got it stitched up they got a plastic surgeon in and she was okay but it was so fast you know you didn't even realize it happened the dog just you know snapped the dog wasn't vicious the dog was trying to grab the uh you know the yeah. little piece 
like they and they did so many takes that she was sitting up and uh you know just it was an accident yeah but strangely enough um the day after the dog bit her the dog died oh it it, from being excited uh something that happens with large dogs they call it a twist at a gut uh it's a stomach twisted and they didn't realize it uh, and this is thing that just happens with large dogs uh you know the vet tells you and uh but because he had just bit her and it died it was like you know they had to do all these tests make sure it wasn't rabid you know what i mean and all of that and that was our a dog um that that we used for most of the stuff and then you know they had like three or four dogs for cujo you know that did different things like lassie you know what i mean the dog that jumps through the window you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh but so uh yeah genius is sweetheart you know but stunts man you know you get hurt they got somebody in the clothes before the ambulance leaves the set you know what i mean uh i don't want to say that they're uh dispensable you know uh replaceable but they are that's what you know that's what stunts are because if the star had gotten bit like that, they'd have to shut down the production, you know, while she healed and it would cost too much money. So a lot of times the actor is capable of doing the stunt, but they don't take the chance because it'll shut down production and, and cost too much money. So, but well, yeah, uh, I was there when Jeannie got. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you about a few of these uh, movies going ape. Yeah, going game. I was doubling the orangutan. Yeah, in, that's in the what I figured. <laughs> yeah. At the six story window. And the guy that had the real orangutan looked up where they wanted it. And he goes, I'm not going to let my monkey go up there. It could get hurt. You know? So, same thing. They wouldn't let, you know, they want to hurt the real orangutan. So, they get a guy in the, the orangutan suit. And I went out across this window chasing um, the guy that was playing uh, Danny DeVito. Uh, the stunt double for Danny DeVito uh, mm -hmm. in a maid's outfit across this uh, six, two six story windows across a courtyard. Uh, anyway, that was what I did in that. Okay. Um, I tell you, Hop was made an animal out of me, Craig. There you go. There they go. The Golden Child. I doubled the Monkey Man in that. Uh, <laughs> they wanted an there was a scene where an acrobatic scene he played you know this uh kind of they called him the monkey man he was like you know his face looked kind of like a monkey and mm -hmm. they want i just needed an acrobat to do it so i got the job doing these acrobatics and i get there and uh the wardrobe was like armor a big metal piece on my chest and and all these you know the pair of you know the leggings with studs it was like and he said well yeah, let me see you do the back summer so i went i can't i'm too heavy you know what I mean? I give me a like an apple box I could do it, but I, I can't even jump. This is too heavy. And the um, the director goes, "Well, start taking some of that stuff off." So they started taking it off, and now the uh, the script supervisor goes, "That's not going to match." The director goes, "What did I tell you about matching?" And the guy goes, "Matching is for sissies." He says, "That's right. Go sit down." So they took all the heavy stuff off. And it's acrobatic. I was going so fast across the screen, you didn't even notice that I wasn't wearing, you know, all the uh, the armor. But that was that was going. Um, you know, um, I forgot the guy's name, Pons, uh, that played the Monkey Man, mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Murphy. That was that movie. <laughs> I made a lot more money in my life being able to do a flip flop than I ever would have made if I had a Bachelor of Arts degree. There you go. There you go. What about the burbs? You get the work, uh, of course, Joe Dante, the director. Yeah, I worked with Joe Dante a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, in, in different things. Um, they're verbs. It was just one of those things when they blow up the building. I was I forgot who I was doubling, just running out, diving over the car as they blow up that whole building. Um, I, if, I don't know if you remember the movie, but there's a scene where the whole building blows up uh, some bob or whatever. And just diving out of the way. That's what they do when you're doing uh, stunts. You know, I remember standing right next to the bomb when they go going live. You're looking at the camera crews across the street with big plexiglass, you know, in front of the lens and in front of all the people. And you're looking there at this bomb 
that you they're going, you know, it's going to go, you know, they're going one, two, three, the bomb's going on three. So you better be like over this railing, you know, and duck before that bomb goes off. But that was another one of those, you know, and you look at the other stunt guy going, what are we doing here? <laughs> because if it goes well, it's no big deal. But if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong and you're going to get injured or killed. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it went well. A lot of those in, in stunts, you know what I mean? They go, uh, this bomb's gonna go off, so you better be on this mark before it goes off. So that was that. Honey, I blew up the kid. What's, what's that? Honey, I blew oh, up honey, the I blew kid. Oh, honey, I blew up the kid. I forgot who I doubled in that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it was just a kid. You know, I doubled a lot of, you know, teenagers and a uh, little kid in it. You know, I was in the pocket of the of the person that, you know, when we were little, just a okay. whole bunch of stuff. Just I, a, I, uh, and the girl that was the, that played the young girl was. Um, Carrie Russell. God, I can't. Yes, Carrie Russell. Just a beautiful. She was a little kid at the time. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. like, you know, a young teenager. Um but she, she was so pretty and so sweet. You know, you knew she was going to have a career, you know. Um, and I was like her mom's age. So I was hanging out with her mom and, you know, and dad, and, you know, um, just talking about, uh, about Carrie. And, you know, it's just a, such a, just a sweet girl, even as a kid. So. Under Siege. Under Siege, I was a, a terrorist. I played uh, <laughs> one of the top. Tommy Lee Jones uh, gang uh, on, and we shot it all on a battleship in Alabama uh, that was docked, you know, one of those like, you know, tourist uh, battleships and we shot all night. And uh, I was one of the, the terrorists shooting guns and, you know, uh, on that. I got burned on that one. Special effects guy. There was a scene where they were blowing this door off mm -hmm. and uh, he said, I'm going to light it up with a little benzoyl fire. I went, so, well, should I put gel on? He went, no, 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 it's nothing. You know, you'll, that was one of those. And the door just opened a little as they were blowing it, blowing the hatch door. And it fanned all the flames at me. And I was in a fireball and got severely burned. Uh, oh. Accidentally, it was one of those deals that, you know, wasn't supposed to be a fireball, but it was. And uh, there was a lot of big fire stuff in that, that, really could have gone wrong you know many times uh but you know that one didn't when they blew the helicopter up for instance you know they put huge explosives in that you know and you're right in the frame you know as these things blow up so uh, that was that, that was fun alabama on a battleship with uh what's his face uh i forget what the star's St name oh, steven seagal yeah, Steven Seagal mm -hmm. doing his Steven Seagal thing, uh, and they had they brought somebody in uh, from the State Department that trains you know counter terrorists and stuff to show us you know little things uh, how to you know as you walk into you know in into the building you know where you, how to hold a gun da, 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 you know all that stuff uh, and it was all you know machine guns and you know, it's fun you know it's like big kids playing cowboys and Indians with you know with blanks so. Okay, uh, Army of Darkness, of course, Bruce Campbell, hilarious guy. Yeah, there was a scene where he breaks up into a lot of little people, like in a mirror. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> they take one of the guys and they hold him by his ankles and uh, Bruce Campbell is like sleeping with his mouth open and they drop one of the little guys off of like a balcony into his mouth. Uh -huh. I was that guy. <laughs> uh, I was the guy throw angles and drop you you know so i would get a lot of those they went the little guy because you're not not too heavy for the other guys to pick up on your ankles and drop you so uh that's what i did in that and that was all on one of those um uh special effects stages you know what i mean i that most of the movie was done on i forgot the director but he was an innovator a sam raimi in that, yeah 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 in that technique you got so yeah. many stunt movies here. Uh, Batman Forever. Yeah, 
uh, God, I did a couple of things in that. Um, when they blow up a hosting, yeah, you know, it just it just stunts, you know, and in the car and uh, Batman Forever. Uh, what else? And I did about three or four things in Batman Forever, you know, in big stunt scenes. You know, a lot of times you're just in a car that's uh, an ND car, you know, that the other car zooming around, or you know, um, Batman Forever. Then I was also in. Was that Batman Forever or the other Bat? I think it was Batman Forever. There was a scene of, it was like day glow. We were all these gang members in an alleyway. Uh, I did that one. It was, you know, they had all these stunt people. Uh, I don't even remember, you know, in, in that. I did two Batmans, Batman Forever. And there was the one that had a circus scene. Was that Batman Forever? I think it was. I was a clown in the circus scene when um, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the uh batman's parents fall off the trapeze mm -hmm. and die you know i was one of those uh there was a whole uh circus scene i was one of the clowns that you know that go around uh when his parents die i think that was batman forever i got the jacket i think so i think so yeah um yeah and of course you do stunts and bean you didn't double for Roland, Rowan, did you? <laughs> double the guy. I forgot his name now. Um, that was his friend that was driving him around. and uh, I doubled him a couple of times in, in movies. I can't think of, of the actor's name now, but he's been on a few series. You know, the, the, the little guy, obviously, I'm the little guy that was in <laughs> Bean. That was, that was like Bean's sidekick or, you know, whatever it was. And... Uh, I did all the driving stuff for him, you know, down Sunset Strip and, and all of that. And uh, also when he was in this one mansion, it was like a, a scene, things blow up. I was I doubled Bean's, uh, you know, assistant. He was great though, because I was a fan he, of his. So, uh, Peter I McNichol? The day. Yeah, Peter McNichol. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. And I doubled him in a couple other things too throughout the years, so. Um, Spawn, another one celebrating a uh, 25th anniversary. Yeah, that was a scene that we did in the um, in the museum. I was one of the stunt guys uh, in that. I don't even remember what the stunt was. Martin Sheen was also in it, though. Um, mm -hmm. Pal of mine. Uh, so it was just one of the scenes in the museum. Oh, there's so you many. You know what? All my crap. A lot of so many credits that you. Oh just, you man, know, yeah. Well, mask. Ma mask I want to go through all of these. <laughs> mask of Zorro. What dreams may come. You know. Uh, any dream, Robin? I, what I any done. Robin Williams stories? Oh yeah, I worked with Robin on uh, on like about three. I was on Hook, and mm -hmm. I was on. Uh, Robin's the sweetest guy, uh, as everybody tells you. I mean, an extra will come up, I want to tell him a joke, you know what I mean? And he'll stop and listen and be kind. And, uh, and you know, he's Robin Williams is bigger than life. I worked on um, What Dreams May Come. I was uh, a bunch of ghosts in that. In one scene, I looked at the movie, I was like five different ghosts hanging on wires, you know what I mean? Floating around. Uh, I, yeah, I did, I just, I'm good on wires because I'm an acrobat and all that. So I mm -hmm. did a lot of movies where you're, Lying around on wires, you know. I did Peter Pan in uh, in Australia, uh, working out a lot of. A lot of times you work out the stunts and you put the actor in it. You know, you make it safe and figure it out, and then you put the actor in it, and, and he'll do it. So, uh, but Rob, yeah, Robin Williams is great at Unhook too, uh, and he saw Pete's Dragon, and he's you know, and he's going to be. He found out I was one of the kids. He's going. Oh my God, you were one of those horrible things. You go, you know, come here, PD, I want to rape you. You know, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of role? <laughs> so we had like a lot of like, because his kids had been watching Pete's Dragon. And he's going, oh my God, that's like, you know, right out of deliverance, you guys. Actually, and I would you tell know, Robin Dr it's, speaking of Pete's Dragon, we never did discuss Pete. Chip, we mentioned all the actors, not Pete. Pete was this great kid. And I, you know, I used to 
teach him tap dancing things. And I wore suspenders all the time. I don't know. Before Mork and Mindy, it was, uh, you know, all these said I used to wear like rainbow suspenders. And I gave him like a whole set of suspenders. He was the sweetest kid, uh, Sean Marshall. Mm-hmm. And uh, that movie, he didn't, he didn't want to do it anymore. But he was, he was just a great little kid actor, you know, and uh, believable. And we taught him all these dance numbers because I was, you know, one, like I said, at first one of the dancers. So I, I taught him a bunch of, uh, of the numbers. And um, I did a, a podcast for somebody else about Pete Stragon. And they actually gave me his phone number. He became a merchant Marine and was into boats and moved somewhere like New Mexico, like a landlocked state. I was always like, you know, and uh, Sean Marshall never worked really after that. And he could have, he could have had a, a kid career, but uh, I don't think uh, it well, just wasn't for him. He didn't like it. And, uh, you know, and his mom was so sweet, you know, I'm like older. So, you know, I used to hang out with, with his, with his mom and stuff, uh, <laughs> but she, yeah, I, I, I try to think of just funny things with him, but you know, he was, he was believable. He looked at, you know, the, the giant, like when they put the dragon, cause they were going to animate it. So they would put like a big cardboard cutout of the dragon just to get the frame right. So that, you know, that they could put the dragon in it later, you know, and he had to like act looking at, just like a little dot or looking at a, you know, a flag up on, uh, uh, you know, on a pole. And uh, he was great. Great kid. Do you have any uh, charities that you want to plug and promote on here that you're involved with? Well, uh, well, uh, a lot of charities that I support, uh, you know, I like to do um, local ones like, you know, Union Rescue Mission, uh, the Midnight Mission. Uh, and then I also do things like Jews for Jesus mm-hmm. and uh, chosen people. And of course, World Vision. Uh, World Vision does a great job uh, internationally. So I try to support local and international and also evangelical. You know, those are the ones that, you know, like that I that I like to support. Um, I'm getting the I've vibe that I get. The, I'm getting the vibe. I did, are, are, um because uh, I read from my Bible. I grew up in a Christian home, you know. Um, I'm getting that vibe with you. Oh, yeah. I, well, I'm Jewish. And years ago, I realized that Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, <laughs> uh, I was living with the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. We, you know, dating. And then I, uh, on an acid trip in New York, I got zapped by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know. And yeah. uh, I oh my god jesus is the messiah and Mm -hmm. uh i came home and told my girlfriend and she got into it and we got married i married 48 years to the love of my life 48 years congratulations man thank you we were together 50 years we're just like right now this month you know you know she moved in 50 years ago uh she moved in on our first date it was you know hippie time and all that and uh then we both got saved and um, had Bible studies at our little place in Laurel Canyon and uh, had a, you know, a little Christian theater groups. And, uh, you know, I'm what they call a Messianic Jew. I'm Jew, a Jew that believes Jesus was the Messiah. So, uh, and that's been the center of our marriage and raised both of our children that way. And, um, you know, it's uh, like I always say, yeah, yeah, two people grow in a marriage to the grow and I was go, but if, if Jesus is the center of your marriage, you're both growing toward the light, growing toward the light instead of, you know, so, uh, but I'm very blessed, you know, I married the love of my life and she still is. And, uh, and there you have it. Yeah. Now, basic born again, Christians. <laughs> now, when you got married, did Shelly Winters give you away? <laughs> no, but uh, Neil Diamond came to the wedding. Um, <laughs> I was already married by the time I met Shelly Winters. I got married uh, in 73. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, I would have been one. <laughs> so, and Neil Diamond, my, uh, my wife is an artist. And uh, it's funny, the, uh, the ex-wife, the guy that produced Logan's Run stayed my friend and she was Neil Diamond's personal like assistant. So my wife used to do scrapbooks for Neil. He had all these cuttings and she would put his scrapbooks together. and. Uh, Neil was a friend. We used to babysit for his kid because uh, his kid didn't like a lot of people. Uh, but 
you know, but I'm, I, we were always fun. So uh, Neil Diamond became a good friend and was at our wedding. Uh, mm -hmm. Very sweet. <laughs> wow. And uh, what's up with Robin these days? I might as well bring her up here. She's doing great. Um, she's married to Mark Wahlberg, who's a TV host. Uh, you mean Temptation not Island. Marky Mark? I teased her about not that, Marky. of course. I teased her about yeah, that, yeah. of course. <laughs> but yeah, no, Robbie's doing great. Um, and uh, like I said, her son's getting married uh, in a week. So very excited about that. And uh and her daughter was a, a, a ballerina in a company and uh, now, uh, you know, teaches ballet. So it's all kind of in the family. But her son actually is a naval aviator, uh, Morgan. He landed on an aircraft carriers and all that. Uh, so he's in the Navy and uh, get married. So Robbie's, uh, Robbie's good. She teaches tap and we take dance class together still. And uh, she, Robbie's got a good, happy life. You know what? I should sometime uh, in the near future get you and her on here together just to hear okay. the stories of you two I as a family. <laughs> I don't fat, know what else. We as a family, yeah. As a family okay. dynamic growing up with that because that's a story in itself. Yeah, well, I'm a lot older than Robbie. I'm 11 years older than Robbie. So uh, she wasn't in the act that I always tease her about because by the time she was born, my parents weren't doing the act, the act anymore. Uh, they mm -hmm. had the dancing school. So, you know, uh, I was already, uh, gosh, I came to California when I was 18. She was a little kid, you know. Uh, so, uh, but she was on Broadway and off Broadway and it's all very close. You know, we're all, you know, we all love each other. It's a big, uh, you know, big, happy, loving family. Uh, in show business and uh, so you can have us both on I guess there you go I'll, I'll see if I can arrange that you know and uh, uh, yeah yeah. We already, uh, I already told you I got no, no, I got no more stories for you <laughs> no more story oh I bet we could jerk some stories out of you but you know what it was wonderful having you come on here today and, and talk to me and bring all these memories up you know and Again, I didn't know you were Robbie Morgan's brother, so I was like, I learned something today. I should get your daughter on here at some point, though, and talk about rings and and coming yeah. out of televisions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's done a lot of creatures. Yeah, she's a because of contortionist. She's always the possessed girl, or the you know the witch, or you know all these uh, creatures that she does. You know, aliens and. Mm -hmm. And she's a talent as well. So, uh, yeah. Well, it was wonderful having you come on here today. Um, I was going to ask you one more question. Um, do you ever get to do the conventions, you know, like uh, the comic cons? And if so, what's the most interesting thing you've ever been asked to sign? Uh, yeah, I, I do those. You know, it's funny because um, I've done a number of things and what people want, you know, mainly it's Cujo. Uh, there's a lot of fans of Cujo, so uh, um, nobody's had beside anything too crazy. You know, they, they'll bring in, you know, posters or videos or, you know, DVD covers and, you know, just the usual stuff. And I, I love doing those conventions. I love meeting the fans and telling them stories. And, you know, and uh, I like people. I, I generally, I like people. I like talking to people and... Uh, so I, I love meeting the fans. Yeah, I do uh, a bunch of those, you know, uh, through or, around the country. So, uh, and a lot of them I do them with my daughter. So she, my daughter, will sign me sign sign for the ring or whatever, and I'll be signing for Cujo. And uh, yeah, we do those. It's fun. We ever going to get a piece? all of a sudden? I don't know how my my phone my uh, address has appeared somewhere, but I I get so much mail now of people wanting me to sign stuff. Uh, and I'm always interested in what pictures they they pull out. You know, I, I get these you know pictures from different uh, different things that I did. I go, wow, I don't even know where they got this picture from. But uh, they need to do Pete, Pete's Dragon versus Cujo. What do you think? Ah, uh, that would be good. I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, it was such a pleasure having you on here, and um, 
Yeah, I'll reach out and see if I can get your daughter on here and uh, maybe get you and Robbie on here to trade brothers, sisters, show business stories, you know. But uh, this was a nice trip down memory lane. I enjoyed this very much. And like I said, Pete's Dragon was the first film I've seen. That was a drive-in that I saw that at. And I still remember it vividly, but I remember it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I know my kids used to watch it and they called it Daddy in the Mud. I want to watch Daddy in the Mud. Okay, I'd put <laughs> it on the video but just when they were little growing up. So, <laughs> anyway, fun. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate uh, telling you stories. It was fun. Before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Sure. What, what, would, you, what would you like me to say? Just state your name and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. I'm Gary Morgan, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert's Python on Paradise. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, keep believing. Keep believing in uh, God. I, I'm, I was proud to hear that, you know. And uh, my dad went and... Uh, been with the lord back in april so uh, after an eight-year battle with als so uh but um, I, I know he's peace at peace right now so so uh and you'll see him again i'll see him again i'll see him again yeah. but anyway you know um you have yourself a wonderful day stay out of the mud <laughs> <laughs> thanks hey. All right. You take care and God bless you. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.